Scott Fickner, injury attorneys, we fight for the win. All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Overrule Podcast brought to you by the Scott Vignair Law Firm. It is a beautiful morning in New Orleans, and it is hotter than the last time we shot, and it just keeps getting hotter, and I am hot, Brad. How about you? I'm sweating. <laughs> <laughs> Melting. We have a great show lined up for everybody today. Our guest, Steve Rahaj, is uh, an incredibly interesting person, a, a friend of mine who has an interesting and unique journey in his life thus far from playing football at LSU um, and in the NFL for the New York Giants, where he learned from the likes of Bill Parcells and Bill Belichick, who he still has a relationship with today, as well as played along the years with some incredibly great football players, culminating with probably one of the best football players of all time in Lawrence Taylor, who was on that Giants team. And Steve's journey also took him over to the Canadian Football League and then into the music industry. Um, where he learned a lot about the music industry and founded a little music festival called Voodoo Fest. Just a little uh, one. A small one. <laughs> Ended up being one of the biggest music festivals in the country um, and the big one of the biggest along with Jazz Fest in New Orleans, which is also a small little music town. Um, so i um, excited to talk to Steve today and learn a little bit about his journey, the things he's learned along the way, and have some funny and I'm sure insightful stories from him. Yeah, i got to tell you, I've always wondered why... Uh... David Vickner had uh, Scott Vickner in front of his, you know, his web address. And <laughs> now I know. <laughs> a lot of people think it's a person. I think in my mind, he's a nice person. Scott Vickner. He's I'd a like good guy. Think so. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, I was hoping you can kind of get us started off by telling our listeners like a little bit about you, um, where you grew up in New Orleans and kind of your upbringing to uh, when you got into playing football, ultimately at JT Curtis and LSU. Um, I, I mean, I grew up downtown, St. Claude Avenue, so, you know, right off the, the back end of the quarter where, you know, we go to dinner now at N7 and drink in the Saturn bar, but wasn't that cool of a neighborhood back then. <laughs> um, and my parents got divorced and one moved to Kenner, the other one moved to Chalmette. So, you know, I got the best of both worlds and, uh, went to John Curtis and from John Curtis, you know, it's, a uh, pretty big focus on sports and commitment and, you know, kind of teaches you how to, how to work. And from there I got, um, I got thrown out of there and then ended up at LSU <laughs> uh, on a football scholarship. So it was a, you know, fortunate turn of events and interesting part of uh, life. What was, um, what was it like playing? Obviously a ton of our listeners, Steve, are huge LSU fans. Uh, most of the people in the state support the football program and team. What was it like? Well, I said for maybe some of the Tulane and ULL people who are listening, but um, I'm not going to go there. We don't have enough time to get into that rabbit hole. Um, what was it like playing at LSU at the time that you played? And what were some of the um, big memories that you have from your time playing at LSU? You know, I think when you're 17 years old, it's hard to, you know, grasp how big of an effect, you know, playing at LSU is. You know, it's one of those things, I think, when you're a freshman and you're a sophomore, you're just kind of learning the process, right? And by the time you get to be a senior, you know, you have fought, if you're still on the team, you have fought for that job. You know, you've fought on that field and it becomes something that's just ingrained and, you know, it's whatever it takes to win kind of mentality. Just the surroundings of it is you know, running out through those goalposts on a Saturday night, there's nothing like it. I remember the first time I did it, <clears throat> I was a redshirt freshman, and the guy that recruited me, Pete Jenkins, you know, we ended up beating, um, I think, Oregon State by, like, 50 points in the opening game. And I was so excited at the end of the game, never played a snap, and ran up to Coach Jenkins and said, you know, thank you, Coach, if I never play it down, you know, this was the greatest night ever. And he's like, if you never play it down, we really fucked up your scholarship. <laughs> <laughs> and he ultimately, I, mean, I think he ultimately came back and coached at LSU <clears throat> recently. Isn't that right, Steve? He did. Um, you know, Pete was known for a very simple technique called two gap, which is exactly what it sounds like. You know, you get that you engage the blocker in front of you and you take both gaps on both sides of him which is, you know, a uh, little bit different. Still playing that technique, but mostly on rundowns. You know, what we know today is the the rush backers that are, you know, going full blast at the quarterback and not, not worrying about the run. So it was a very specific technique that 
you know, is now on his license plates and <laughs> he's got the website two gap coached with Andy Reed. You know, there was a great story with Andy Reed uh, when he was at Philadelphia. And I think he, Carl Dunbar had just left and Carl played at LSU and was a disciple of uh, Pete Jenkins and Andy Reed. So, you know, why do we keep talking about getting disciples of the two gap technique? Why don't we just go get Pete Jenkins? And they were like, eh, you know, he's kind of 75 years old at the time. He's like, well, just call him up. And Pete ended up coaching for the Eagles for a couple of years with Andy. And then when Coach O took over at LSU, he was the defensive line coach. And he, again, is a disciple of uh, Pete Jenkins. So he just brought the mentor in. And, you know, Pete was 80. I think Pete's like 83 right now. So he's about 80 years old when he was coaching. Wow. Unbelievable. Um, and I think the other interesting thing, too, at least from my perspective, Steve, and watching your um, – your life now based upon your time playing football at LSU and how big of an impact it had on you mm-hmm. and how many of those relationships that you developed over the years are still intact and, and how y'all still do things together and still may go to events and support the program. Can you talk a little bit about that? Like the journey from after playing at LSU and to today and those relationships and how you've maintained some of them throughout the years? I mean, I, th- I think it's something when you, you know, spend that much time together and you're being pushed, um, you know, to be your best. It's, it's a competition thing where, you know, you're really being pushed to compete every day, you know, classroom to the football field. But, you know, you see a lot of people through, go through the program, but if you end up spending, you know, three to five years with somebody in that atmosphere, you become very tight. And, you know, I remember I had a, you know, couple crazy things go on and you know really when you find out who your friends are and there was uh one christmas where i was you know just kind of uh out west and you know hanging out and walked up woke up on christmas day went for a walk on the beach came back um and then there were 52 messages from players former players directly from lsu um but you know it's 20 something years later, you know, it's, it's hard to keep those relationships, but it's it's certainly a special bond. And, you know, I've been lucky because with between voodoo and essence through the years, you know, I would, I would see pretty much everybody at least once a year, if, you know, not more. So people would come in for essence and, you know, we'd get them hooked up with tickets and hang out a bit. And then, you know, same thing with voodoo. So that it's a special bond that uh, I think we all have. And ultimately, you leave LSU and you end up in the NFL um, playing for the Giants. So I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about that specifically. Um, I mean, I think our listeners would be interested to know. I was kind of like blown away by some of the players and the coaches that you were able to to be around and learn from and develop relationships um, during your time at the Giants. Could you tell us a little bit about that experience? I think there's a saying in the NFL that it stands for not for long. And that was definitely in my case. Um <laughs> You know, I played with the Giants when I got up there. There was a, you know, whole crazy story where my roommate was getting married and a couple of people got hurt. And basically the guy named Coach Fontes, the defensive back coach, called me and said, you know, we need to, to we want to sign you. And I hung up on him thinking it was a practical joke. And then the second person that called me was uh, Coach Belichick, who said, listen, yeah, now I'm going to fucking step on the field. <laughs> just need somebody that can learn the playbook in a day, but you have to agree to your terms right now. Cause we had already negotiated and it didn't go well. <laughs> you know, but long story short, you know, I got up to New York and, you know, ended up starting on the Monday night game that, you know, I hadn't trained for six months and it was a very painful game, or a very painful next morning. Um, we still have the highlight reel from uh, that game. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, it was, uh, Coach Belichick was the defense coordinator at the Giants at that point. And um, we have stayed in touch through the years, remained friends. His uh, his sons have uh, both worked for us, uh, big music lovers. Bill's a big music fan. Lawrence Taylor was on the team. Now, you know, that was the Giants Super Bowl team. So, you know, I kind of got uh, initiated or lack of, you know, initiation from the rest of the players because I had played with a guy named Leonard Marshall, who was a, a senior when I was a freshman, and uh, he was a big part of those Super Bowl teams. So Leonard took me under his wing and 
didn't let anybody mess with me. Yeah. <laughs> Bill Parcells was the head coach of that team. Is that right, Steve? Correct. Yeah, it's just amazing to think, like, right, that you were you had the opportunity to play for the Giants and Bill Parcells as a coach, and one of your primary coaches was Bill Belichick, two of the guys who I think are thought of to be two of the better NFL head coaches ever. And then Lawrence Taylor is playing on the team who changed the – the way that left tackles are compensated. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt about that. I don't know if there is something, Steve, but one thing I was thinking about in preparing for your show is, you know, I've had the pleasure through our friendship to meet, for example, one of the people you played with at John Curtis being Reggie Depard. A lot of people don't know what has the SMU rushing record over Eric Dickerson, uh, an incredible athlete. And then some of the people you played with at LSU, like we've talked about, like Eric Andelsek, um, tragically died, but one of the best offensive linemen probably who ever have seen played the game. Um, and then you play with Lawrence Taylor. What what are some of the common things that you saw, if anything, between some of these like incredibly gifted and star players that you had the chance to play with? You know, it's it's hard to put like Reggie and Eric into the LT category because right. I mean we know how LT performed on the field, but LT was complete chaos, and I, I think that's you know the connection I would say between Parcells and Belichick and Lawrence sort of as you know to this day Belichick considers Lawrence the the greatest NFL player ever. It's that you know it's a chaos. I mean with Parcells it's nobody had a job except for Lawrence. Like, you know, Phil Sims didn't have a job. Bavaro didn't have a job. And every day, Parcells would just stir the pot, you know, cutting people. And it, it was a chaotic situation. And I, I think Belichick has kind of taken that concept and refined it a little bit, where it's not the wild, wild west. Right. Um, but, you know, he's still not, you know, when you're in the building, they're not the most likable people in the world, right? They, you know. They're going to push you and, you know, there's going to be a lot of curse words. And, you know, you know, one of the first days I got there, Belichick picked up a, a desk, like, you know, one of those school desks and threw it up against the wall and told somebody he was the biggest C word, <laughs> um, you know, tough to scale from one to 10. He was a zero. And, you know, you watch this, you know, six foot seven, 300 pound guy start crying. <laughs> Do you think that chaos was kind of by design? That's how they thought they could get the optimal results? Or was that more their, their personalities coming out? Both. I think, you know, you, you watch, you know, the coaches that come down from that tree and certainly like Sean Payton, I think, had that, you know, he knew how to push the, the right buttons. Parcells would have never had a relationship with Drew Brees like, Sean Payton supposedly had. Um, it just wasn't his personality. Like, you know, he was a yeller and screamer at the quarterbacks, and which, you know, supposedly, you know, nobody else does, but right. Um, it was definitely by design. Um, and so at some point you leave the NFL and then you end up in the music industry. How does that happen? Um, and walk us through how you ended up beginning your journey to eventually being the founder and, and starting and creating Voodoo Fest? You know, basically growing up in New Orleans, you know, you, if you're a music fan, there's a lot of opportunities here. And, you know, certainly the set of friends that, you know, I was hanging out with high school, Steve Brown and Hector and these guys that I think, you know, you've met at my place. You know, we'd go to Jimmy's Music Club every night and, you know, see the new punk rock band or the new this band. And it's, you know, we were 16 years old with fake IDs going into all these music clubs. And it was just, you know, kind of in in your blood here. So, you know, I think, you know, if you're in a, in a locker room, you know, the joke is, you know, football players, sports guys, they're always talking about their investments in music. And, you know, guys that are on Wall Street are always talking about sports and music. <laughs> and, you know, music's the common denominator between, you know, all of those things. And, when I finished playing, I was just, you know, I ended up going to Europe for two years, you know, landed in France, flew back two years later from Japan, I had like $100 in my bank account, landed in New York. And I was like, all right, what do you do with life? <laughs> and, uh, you know, looking back, if I knew what I knew now, I probably wouldn't have made those same decisions. <laughs> but at the time, I was dumb enough, like, you know, 
<laughs> I mean, I think the common denominator is right. You know, in sports, they train you to be invincible. You, know, you think you can walk through, run through any wall in the music business. I was just like, ah, you know, I can do this. <laughs> um, and, you know, learned a lot of hard lessons put it that way. <laughs> What gave you the um? What gave you the idea to start Voodoo? I mean, all the stuff we talked about. I don't think I've ever really asked you that. Like, how did you come up with the idea to start it? What led you to it? If there was one thing, I'm sure, it was multiple things. Well, the the way I actually got in the the business was um, I was playing in the Canadian League. You know, I like to say after Bill Parcells uh, traded me to the Canadian League, meaning he cut me. Um, <laughs> I started working on my MBA at Tulane and then I'd, you know, fly to New York on Thursdays and I was taking an entertainment marketing course there. And then, you know, we'd go play wherever the Ottawa Rough Riders were playing. And there was a woman named Karen Thomas that came in and presented the concept of entertainment marketing. And Karen, you know, crazy as it seems these days, Karen was the marketing director for Essence Magazine when they started the Essence Music Festival. And she had just spun off to her own consulting firm. So she came in and explained basically, you know, publications were having, you know, they were struggling raising revenue, you know, selling rep, uh, selling ads, and they needed a advantage over the the rest of the competition. And that's where you know Elson started. She was responsible for you know going to the clients and going like, you know, if you want to do Elson's music festival, you know, this is what the rest of the year looks like as a partner with us. And at the end of that presentation, I went up and introduced myself and her husband, who was her partner in the consulting firm said, you played for the New York Giants, didn't you? (laughs) You got to be the biggest New York Giants fan ever. (laughs) You remember that Monday night football game. (laughs) That one day I played, right? Um, (laughs) So I started working for them uh, the next off season and worked for them for a year. And the first project we did was the uh, Coca-Cola Reebok Blacktop Challenge, which was a three-on-three basketball tour that went around the country. And it was one of the harder things, you know, you're setting up Philadelphia and New York City and, you know, some crazy neighborhoods where, you know, a thousand courts are all over, you know, downtown Manhattan, basically. At the world, that one was specifically at the World Trade Center. It was wrapped around the main court. Was at the center of the World Trade Center, and you, the management process was completely insane. And you know, you were dealing with laying out these courts all over the place. And then once the game started, you know, people are fighting, and you know, whole new meaning to shootout in basketball, right? And it's gun pulled, and so oh, the good learning training you got in the NFL worked out well. Then it was a good learning curve, yeah. <laughs> And then the next year, the um, final four was in New Orleans. So I created a property, gotten the permits from the city, you know, it's kind of a small town and you have to kind of know people here. Um, so we pulled those permits and believe it or not, the last basketball court was right in front of the building that uh, is at uh, Julia Street. Um, so the, you know, the main court was in the Ernst Cafe parking lot up by Harris Casino. Oh, wow. and they ran all the way down the street. And the concept was, you know, basically got no relationships with sponsors and you know, just starting out. But if we have all the streets going from every hotel to the Superdome, pretty good shot. We'll be able to sell this, right? And ended up with Adidas and Miller and, you know, like 10 big sponsors that we would have never gotten based here in New Orleans, if not for the overlay of a national event happening that weekend which eventually turned into the whole concept of voodoo which was why it was on halloween originally was you know new orleans small market not a big you know not a lot of companies here with big money to sponsor those kind of events and not a lot of brands here that it makes sense for right but with the overlay of halloween and you know the talent that we were bringing in we had the opportunity to go pitch anybody in the world and ended up with, a you know, bringing a lot of big sponsors here that, you know, helped fund the start of that. And that's kind of how it cranked out. You took an idea and you created one of the biggest music venues and events in a music cap, one of the music capitals in the country um, in Voodoo Fest, which is incredible and which not many people could say about their lives or anything they've accomplished. So 
having done that and taking it from an idea to this huge recognizable internationally recognized music festival um what what are some of the key takeaways or learning lessons that you had in growing that business that you can talk about <laughs> or want to talk about <laughs> that maybe our listeners could take a a lesson or two away from um from your journey and and starting that from that idea to where it is today been 23 years at this point so you know it started in 1999 you know at that point you had a handful of the old school festivals which were you know jazz fest and you know, if you can still call it jazz fest thematically, <laughs> you know, those those traditional festivals that had been happening for basically, you know, 30 to 40 years at that point. And the landscape was much different. So, you know, if you look back in 99, there were two festivals that started that year, which was Coachella and uh, Voodoo. Oh, wow. And, you know, they kind of grew up in parallel paths. You know, Paul T, who's the producer of Coachella, is a good friend. And, you know, we had a lot of conversations about the, you know, how it works. How do you keep it going? How do you, you know, keep growing it? And certainly, I don't think either one of them looked like what it did in 99. You know, certainly Coachella's, you know, changed a lot with its demo and the music it's presenting and has, you know, kept up with the times and he's done a really good job with it. You know, you just look at the two differences between those two and, you know, we'd always have these, you know, kind of like, hey, screw you at the end of the year, right? Because in Palm Springs, it's 80 and beautiful all the time. Right. So, you know, I'd send them messages like, fuck you. I've got ducks swimming on my stage right now, right? It's, you know, City Park is six feet underwater at this point. And, <laughs> you know, the, the idea of, you know, the terrain is a, a very big issue. So, you know, I guess our biggest challenge was you know 2005 where you know the festival is still kind of in its infancy and you get hit with katrina right and you know it was a, it was a tough decision right and it was a really hard time for everybody here and we made the decision to do the festival which was 59 days after the levees broke and we moved to city park to audubon park um built everything in memphis and then you know, rolled it down Highway 55 and set it up. And it was basically, the, you know, there were no ticket sales. There were no fence. It was just like, we've got to prove that the city's coming back, you know, that it's viable for the city to come back, which I got to tell you, it was the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, right? It was just, you know, you're changing bands, you're flipping cities, you're trying to figure out what to do with it. Um, but the day it happened, it was the greatest thing I've ever seen, you know see people back in New Orleans. I mean, at the time, uh, the fly at the at Audubon Park was the only green space in New Orleans. Wow. Yeah. So, you know, special day. And I think that the event itself, is, you know, has a special place in, in, in my world. And, you know, been some recent developments and hopefully we, we see it back and it continues on. In that journey, Steve, you mentioned your relationship um, and friendship with the person who started Coachella. And how important have those industry relationships and sort of those almost like business to business mentorship type friendships been in your journey? Meaning, I'm assuming you learn like we do the similar thing. There's mastermind groups with law firms where you kind of meet with other law firm owners and, and talk through struggles, challenges you're facing, you develop relationships. How important was that for you along that journey? You know, it was interesting because and coming from, you know, a sports background and the kind of friendships that we talked about earlier, it's a very different world in the in the music business that I found. I, you know, it's <laughs> in sports, you know, if you have a problem with somebody, you kind of deal with it in the locker room and you work it out and then you go on and play together and, you know, you end up lining up next to each other. In the music industry, I'm not sure that's the case. You know, you've got some people that are pretty shady and, you know, there's certainly some great people, but you've got to weed people out pretty quickly. You know, on the, the side that we were in is, you know, booking talent and dealing with, you know, agents and managers. They're representing an artist that they may or may not have a you know, close relationship with and the artist can fire them at any moment. So 
you know, there's always kind of this disconnect of who you're talking to. And, you know, there's a general rule that you, you don't talk to the artist unless they give you approval to do it. So you're kind of stuck dealing with a certain group of people and you don't really know their relationship. So it takes a, a, a number of years to figure out, you know, who the good guys and who the bad guys are. Right. And uh, separate that. I'm sure it's like everything else in the world. You know, I'm sure the, I mean, next to, uh, Music agents is probably attorneys. Yeah. <laughs> Next to, I was going to put them in front, but I mean, you, you think you're being generous because you like me, or I think you like me, so. <laughs> Steve, do you think, you know, growing up in sports and, you know, your progression <laughs> to football, you grew up in a very highly competitive environment, you know, and, and I, I find a lot of people who go through the sports arenas as, as kids and through high school and stuff like that, they bring that competitiveness with them after sports are finished into the business sector as well. And I think those those skills of competitiveness and that work ethic that you get from sports translates well over into business as well. Have you found those kinds of things as far as that kind of training has benefited you now running a business of your own? 100%. Even when you you know you talk to kids today, you know talk to kids 20 years ago, right? It, if they're not involved in that, it the idea of like competing on a daily basis it's kind of foreign and unless they're, you know, trained to do that. I don't think it's a, a, a natural instinct unless, you know, you've got your back against the wall, kind of the burn the bridges mentality, mm -hmm. but you know, burn the boats mentality and the bridges. The fact that, you know, you're doing that in, you know, sixth, seventh, eighth grade. I think you see people go one or two directions. They either take that and embrace it and, you know, move it on in a positive way to whatever they're doing in their life or they shut it down and go like, you know, it's not meant for me. I'm going to go sit on the couch and watch the Flintstones. Yeah. <laughs> so I find some of the more successful people that we talk to, they have this mindset where that lion's always chasing them. You know, there's, there's always something driving them and pushing them. And I feel like we get a lot of that from sports. I remember having a uh, a Nike poster up on my wall as a kid, like right in the middle of uh, Mick Jagger and Steven Tyler. It was, uh, there is no finish line. Remember that old poster? That was a good one. Yeah. Well, I can tell you, going back to Voodoo Fest just real quick, and I forgot what year it was. It was many years ago. One of my fondest memories I had with one of my cousins, um, we went to Voodoo Fest. It was supposed mm -hmm. to be Green Day, who we were big fans of. They were supposed to show up, and something happened. I think they canceled the end. Metallica was the yeah. uh, was the act that replaced them. So I have this fond memory of Metallica at dusk at night with the fall coming in and the beginning, you know, inner Sandman. It's one of my greatest memories of a, a music festival ever. The, the real story goes, they had called us and wanted to play. They played in 2004, which was a really cool day. Green Day, but it was the Pixies, Green Day, and then the Beastie Boys. And so they called that year and was like, they're going out on tour the following year. They just want to do one big event, um, you know, get on the radar. Mm -hmm. And it was the, the contract read, should have known you guys back then, the contract read only festival of the year. And they ended up signing and playing the um, iHeart Radio Festival at Las Vegas, which, you know, we had some words over myself and their agent. And you know, it's like, it's not going to go well. And they're placed right before Britney Spears. And the producer pulled the plug on Green Day because they were going over into Britney Spears' time. And Billy Joe lost his oh, mind, wow. smashed the guitar, called everybody, you know, F you, this, that. And I remember talking to the agent like on Sunday morning, going, are we okay in this one? And he's like, yeah, we're good, we're good. And then Monday morning, he's like, Billy's in rehab. They're out. <laughs> and this is oh, the. It well, was an upgrade for Metallic. I mean, we thoroughly enjoyed them. Yeah, well, that was the Monday before, you know, the event. And they were headlining Saturday night. And, you know, getting Metallica to, to route everything in. That was a, a crazy. I can only imagine the behind. Crazy 48 the hours. Happened. <laughs> <laughs> Did you sleep much? Yeah. <laughs> Some more of that chaos. And there's the picture. <laughs> Somewhere along the way, Steve, I know that you develop a relationship with Steve Gleason and his wife and and became close friends with him um, even before his diagnosis, his terrible diagnosis with ALS. 
and and you're incredibly involved with his philanthropy and and with Team Gleason. So hoping you could just talk a little bit about that and kind of plug Team Gleason and some of the great work that it does for ALS research. Well, I mean, first of all, you know, Steve and Michelle are two of the sweetest, greatest people I know. And, you know, we you talk about that, um, you know, no white flags commitment. I don't think there's a, a stronger pay, person on the universe than Steve Gleason. And so, you know, it's funny that I met him, I met both of them at the same night when I was uh, waiting outside of Lola's on Esplanade and uh, sitting on a stoop, like, you know, as you do in New Orleans, sitting on a stoop and Steve and Michelle are, are next to us and we end up sitting at the na- the same table, you know, by the end of the, by the time they gave us the table, we were just like, just give us one of them. <laughs> and I guess this had to be 2007. Because after the seventh bottle of wine, I remember saying, yeah, I'm not supposed to say this, but we just confirmed Rage Against the Machine today to play Voodoo, which <laughs> ended up being like Michelle's favorite band at that moment. So the night ended with Michelle. And I don't know if you've ever met Michelle, but, you know, she's five foot nothing and, you know, weighs 78 pounds. And her jumping around and breaking all my furniture with Rage cranked up to 11. <laughs> remember waking up the next morning and like, looking at all my furniture broken. I was like, I think, I think I'm going to like these guys. <laughs> um, so, you know, we've had some, some great adventures before Steve's di- uh, was diagnosed. And, you know, since then there's, I've watched him do some of the most amazing stuff that, you know, normal people just don't do. I remember, you know, two weeks after he was diagnosed, calling me going, you know, I've got a list of things I need to check off and wanted to see if you can help me with. The first one is I, I want to record my voice, um, like read every word in the dictionary. Can you help me set up a studio so I can do that? And what's the purpose of that? I was like, well, you know, I'm going to get Michelle pregnant and have kids. You, know, you were just diagnosed. You're going to get Michelle pregnant. You know, you're going to get your MBA. You're going to jump out of an airplane. You're going to climb Machu Picchu, and you're going to record the entire dictionary. Yeah, that 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 was his list of things. I'm like, I think I'd be in bed right now, you know, with the sheets <laughs> over my head. And this guy's just like embracing it and going, you know, this is my purpose in life. And I think, you know, lessons from Steve Gleason. I think we we can all take them. And you know, Steve said, uh, you know, this is my purpose in life at one point, and things changed and now he's got a new purpose and certainly the the foundation that he created since then you know you see a lot of nonprofit foundations pop up but i mean they've embraced it not from like you know this is a foundation that supports what we're doing how do we resolve this issue you know globally and if you go back and do some of the research i mean now every computer has, you know, the eye reading capabilities that Steve uses to speak with, right? So, you know, when he recorded his voice, what he had in his mind was, I'm going to need a computer to help me speak. And literally what he said that day is like, you know, I don't want my kids hearing like a Steve Hawkins type of voice, which, you know, Steve Hawkins is his idol at the time. And he's saying, I just, you know, I want to, I want the ki- my kids to know my own voice, right? which people are doing now. Uh, because Steve decided to do that, right? And the software is now embedded into every Mac and every uh, PC that you can do that for free. You know, at the time, it cost like 15 grand just to set that up. Wow. You know, this foundation is doing incredible things, and, you know, they're, they're beautiful people. Awesome. Um, and now I know, Steve, um, some of the things that you're so you can tell us just a little bit about some of the things you're working on now specifically one of them one of the coolest things that i know you're involved with as a local bar that you've kind of revived with some industry friends and colleagues chicky wawa um, which is an incredible live music venue locally i was hoping you could talk a little bit about how um chicky wawa came to be and your involvement in it recently um came about as well as tell our listeners a little bit about it and and that type of thing well, Chickies is uh, on Canal Street outside of the French Quarter and, you know, kind of a little crazy neighborhood that there's a no man's land at uh, nighttime. And uh, the guy that started it, Dale, passed away uh, last year. And I had some friends that 
they kind of were watching it and saying, you know, we were friends with Dale and we want to see it remain Chicky Wawa. And at a point where it was looking like it was going to be shut down and become a insurance agency or, you know, something else, a group of our friends stepped in and decided that they would invest in it and, you know, keep it as a, a music club. A friend of mine called me and said, like, you know, this is what's going on. Would you be interested? And I was like, hell no, I hate that club. <laughs> yeah. worst, worst club I've ever been to in my life. The middle of Canal Street? What are you talking about? Yeah. Ended up, it. <laughs> ended up being a, yeah. Little did you know. <laughs> so, you know, we spent good four months cleaning the place up and putting a new PA system in, putting a new roof in. And so, you know, consulted a lot of the, the local artists and certainly, you know, David Twerkin last week called and was like, I heard you're involved in Chicky Wawa. You know, you got to pull that stage up and put a bunch of sand in there so it quits reverbing. Like, yeah, okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's all Andrews and let's everybody chip in and figure out how we fix this place. So there were a lot of the the old school guys that, you know, used to play there and they would send us their list of complaints. And we we tried to go down that list and check them all, check them all off. And now I think uh, everybody agrees that, you know, it, it sounds great and we've been having fun with it. Yeah, yeah, I've done a great job with it, Steve. Just the place itself physically looks fantastic. And I know... It is kind of in the middle of nowhere in Canal, but it is, you know, it, I know it's a big neighborhood, a big thing for that neighborhood. And a lot of regulars who I think you all have done a really conscious job of making sure that you modernize it um, and fix it up, but also bring you know, and bring good new talent maybe that you, they couldn't get before, but also ensure that um, ensure that it, it is that place that the regulars and, and the supporters felt like it, they were at home. That's a it's kind of a delicate way. balance, isn't it? Yeah. And I think really what's driving it right now is just the, the music, the music programming. Um, a friend of ours, Patrick Templeman, who's one of the owners, um, took on the booking process and has really gone over, over the top with it. And, you know, one getting you know national acts in that would normally play there, um, but also you know working with the locals to do interesting programming and kind of you know open it up and go you know what do you guys want to do? Is there a project that you've been wanting to do for a while that you couldn't normally do or couldn't normally sell somewhere else? So you know it's kind of an art for art's sake type of project. So with all the all the along your journey, Steve, both from football music industry um and all the stories i know i've heard a lot of them um throughout your life and i think there's probably a lot more i haven't heard i was hoping you just share one really funny or crazy story that you're willing to talk about that maybe we haven't hit on yet that um just kind of was something that stuck out in your memory along your journey thus far i don't think the, all you know the stories that uh, you have heard at two in the morning are appropriate for this <laughs> podcast so. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't talking about those. <laughs> <laughs> or better yet, let, let's shift over to maybe a different a closing topic um, along the same vein, um, all, all along that journey uh, in your playing days and, and starting Voodoo and in, in the music industry and the things that you're doing now. Um, what do you consider, and it's a horror question for you, you're a very humble person, um, but what do you consider your superpower if you could – Say like one thing that you are uniquely talented or you uniquely good at that's kind of helped you achieve some success along the way. It'd probably be that saying, you know, you can't kill bad grass. <laughs> Just keep coming back. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that, but you're not giving yourself enough credit, aren't you? I th wouldn't you say, I mean, you just have a unique ability to really connect people and connect with people that I've observed to you. Do you wouldn't you say that's kind of maybe one of the things that's helped you along? You know, I don't really know how to answer that. It's a, I think that would be for other people. Um, I feel fortunate. I've got a good group of friends. You know, I've got a good group of long-term friends that go back to high school. And a lot of them aren't in the same industry. So I think it's, you know, it's a fine balance. Um, I don't know if there's any superpowers that are, people really have. I think, you know, you go to work and, you know, you focus on what you're doing and, do you overcome obstacles and, you know, goes back to, you know, do you want to compete every day or half of it's showing up, right? It's, a, it's the showing up and doing what you need to do. Yeah. yeah. Consistently, right? And 
that doing it consistently. I, I try not to do anything consistently, but some things you have to. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Well, and I think I've also deduced one of your superpowers out of you, uh, which I know also from our discussions early in the morning, a contrarian at heart. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> well, Steve, uh, thanks so much. For- <laughs> if, if you're going to debate, you got to debate, right? <laughs> Steve, thanks so much for being with us. Um, I, uh, for starters, I appreciate you being here. Um, an incredible journey you've had thus far in your life from football to the music industry. And I know from uh, talking to you both about Chicky Wawa and some other things going on, you just got that there's a, a bright next chapter for you as well. And that there's just a lot of exciting things you have to come. Thanks so much for being with us and sharing some of those insights and stories along your journey. Appreciate it. What are, what are we overruling, by the way? Uh, we're, I don't think we're overruling anything. <laughs> I'm gonna, uh, didn't I'm not overruling you either, Steve. <laughs> Thanks for doing this, Steve. All right, guys. See you soon. Take care. Bye bye. All right. Well, that was an incredible show, Brad. Um, I don't know about you. Really, um, I love the football stories. Being a former football player, so I love every time Steve will tell me like a football old football story. Um, especially like as a little inner kid in me when I, he starts talking about people like the people he's interacted with. Oh, which is amazing. The, the play, I mean, Lawrence Taylor and like, um, yeah, Reggie, I mentioned Reggie DePort and Eric Andelsack, but he's played with incredible, uh, incredibly talented stars throughout his journey. So but just to be in the same room as Parcells and Belichick. Oh, man. I mean, one of the first <laughs> books growing up, my dad had me read about leadership was written by the big tuna, Bill Parcells. So it's a great book. Um, but yeah, no question about it. And then just listening to his story about the music industry and Voodoo Fest, as well as, you know. Uh, Steve Gleason, probably one of the top 10 role models of mine, uh, just because of the person. the courage he has displayed since he's been diagnosed with ALS and the incredible work that I know that Team Gleason is doing to raise money for ALS research and advancing that that ability to, to both make people who are diagnosed with ALS have a, a, a better comfort in the end of their life, along with hopefully one day coming up with a cure. For their Absolutely. Disease. I think at this point we need to adjourn to Chicky Wawa. I agree. Chicky Wawa <laughs> it is. Y'all need to all check out Chicky Wawa. They got some incredible music lined up, so please make sure you visit their website or online. Um, you'll be really shocked at the the consistent talent of music lineup that you, you can go see at Chicky Wawa. So, been a great show. Thank you all for listening. This has been Overruled, brought to you by the Scott Vignair Law Firm. We're looking forward to seeing you next time. Take care. Scott Vignair, injury attorneys, we fight for the win. Information is for illustrative purposes only and does not constitute tax, investment, or legal advice. Always consult with a qualified investment, legal, or tax professional before taking any action.